This is Karen Peterson with Not Sheep Gallery. And Not Sheep is a gallery that shows controversial artwork, including political, religious, um, about LGBTQ issues, um, racism, sexism, all sorts of things that people like to talk about and argue about and presents uh, controversial art for people to have discussions about. And our current show is featuring Paul Richmond's work and his series called Voter Profile. And in this series, um, and in this discussion, we'll be talking to a, a lot of the models he used for his Voter Profile series. These are some of the paintings from the show. Ah, there we go. And Voter Profile is really, really, um, relevant considering what just happened today. Woohoo! Anyway, <laughs> here's Paul Richmond, and he'll talk a little bit more about it. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to start off by saying congratulations to our new president, Joe Biden, and Vice President Kamala Harris. I think that today is a perfect day for a conversation about voting, the history of voting in our country, and the way that different people at different points in time have been disenfranchised by the process. Because that, as we have seen, continues to this day. We have a, a president currently in office who has tried to invalidate votes simply on the basis of them not being in his favor. And we, if we look back at history, we have seen that repeat over and over again. People in power who are afraid of other people from different groups sharing different perspectives. And as a white cisgender male, I really wanted to spend some time examining my own privilege and thinking about um, the different groups in our society who have not always had the right to exercise their voice and be a part of this democratic process. So my concept was to paint portraits of individuals that I knew who were from these different groups, people who would have been denied the right to vote at some point in history for some reason. And then in the background of the paintings, I collaged ballots from the first election that, they, that that group would have been able to vote in. And it was really an interesting process for me. A lot of my art is portrait based because I love people. I'm a, you know, a really empathetic person. I get you know, into hearing about other people's stories. For me, it's not just trying to make a painting that looks like someone, but it is actually trying to capture their essence and share a little bit about them. So, so this series of paintings for me was really about connecting the personal with the broader narrative of our history as a country. Um, and in doing that, I really learned a lot. And I actually wanted to just share a few of these dates with you before we get started, because it's pretty staggering to think about how recently some of these groups have been disenfranchised by our country. So if we go back to the very beginning of, of voting rights in the US, and I promise this won't be long, this is not a history lesson, but I just wanted to share a few of the, few of the dates that really jumped out at me. Um, so in 1789, the Constitution grants states the power to set voting requirements. And generally, states limited this right to property owning or tax paying white men. Then in 1790, the Naturalization Act allowed white men, of course, it had to be white men, born outside of the United States to become citizens and then they could have the right to vote. In 1870, which was 80 years later was the first time that non-white men and freed male slaves were guaranteed the right to vote by the 15th Amendment. But just because they were guaranteed that right doesn't mean that it was honored. Southern states suppressed the voting rights of black and poor white voters through Jim Crow laws and the Supreme Court allowed them to do it. In 1920, 
women were granted the right to vote, but in, in practice, the same restrictions that hindered the ability of poor or non-white men also now applied to poor or non-white women. In 1924, Native Americans were granted citizenship and the right to vote, but some Western states continued to ban them from voting until 1948. 1943, Chinese immigrants were given the right to citizenship and the right to vote. 1965, not that long ago, the Voting Rights Act was established to protect voter registration and voting rights for racial minorities. 1966, tax payment and wealth requirements for voting are prohibited. So before that, they could certainly use that as a way to, to restrict and limit people from having access to voting. In 1971, adults aged eight, 18 through 21 were given the right to vote by the 26th Amendment. And then in 1982, Congress required states to take steps to make voting more accessible for the elderly and people with disabilities. So those are just a few of the dates that I came across in doing my research for the series. And what just struck me over and over again as I was reading about the history is how so many people had to fight for so long in order to make change happen. You know, I can throw out a date. I can say 1920 is when women were finally given the right to vote. But that date doesn't tell the full story. Women were fighting for a hundred years before that in order to make that happen. So it, at this point in history where we find ourselves today where you know sometimes progress seems very slow or backwards, through doing this series of paintings, interacting with my friends, learning a little bit more about our history, it's taught me that it is worth continuing to fight. If, if people could go to prison in order to gain the right to vote for their group, it is, it is worth it for all of us to stay in this fight. And, and we do see progress happen as we have seen this morning, even though sometimes it's a very close call and it's not as fast as we would like. So now that's enough of me talking. <laughs> I really want to use this opportunity to amplify the voices of all of those who um, shared their stories with me and were willing to pose for the paintings in this series. And I'm going to start off with a really inspiring, wonderful friend of mine named Helen Rucker, who lives here in Monterey. She actually runs her own voting registration center because voting is so important to her. She sets herself up and people who have any questions about how to register or how to vote, go in and talk with Helen. And so I was able to speak with her yesterday and, and have her share some thoughts and I can't wait for you all to hear it. So here is Helen Rucker. I'm Helen Rucker, um, 88 years old. Ever since I was a little girl, I remember how uh, my, my father was so important in my life. In fact, he raised me as a single father. He stressed that I should get an education, and one of the things I had to do was to help other people in the neighborhood. I read early. I could read and write and write letters for people and what have you, and I did that on the front porch, just as I'm doing now, <laughs> just as I'm doing now. You're still teaching us. <laughs> I'm still, I have people who came with their ballots and explained this to me and do this for me and, wow. and what have you, and e even though I didn't have my office open, uh, they came here. <laughs> they, they know where to find me. Of course, I did some on the computer uh, uh, with uh, uh, sending things out to people to tell them uh, uh, how to vote and where to vote and, and how to, to um, access services that they needed. Why has voting always been so important to you? Well, you know what? Mainly because they didn't want black people to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because we didn't, they didn't want us. And I saw it as such an important part of being an American, what being an American meant. And it did not mean that, uh, uh, that, you, that just some people could register and vote. It, it should have meant that everybody, and even now when I listen to what's happening, how, how they try to restrict people, even in 
2020, they're still trying to restrict people from voting. The fight never goes away. Our institutions are just under attack, not just voting. The American way is under attack. And this is not a time for people to give up. People have to retain what being American means to us. Our institutions have to be defended all over again. Stuff that we, I never thought uh, at 88 years old I'd still be defining what being an American means in this country. And, and I want everybody to, to know that they should not only vote, they should defend the institutions. We should defend our, our doctors and our people who, who treat our health uh, uh, issues. Uh, and, and all of the other institutions that you can think of that makes you an American, you have to defend them now. You may have been, they haven't even thought, and I know young people have not thought very much about it, but they're turning out in droves, and I'm so happy that I was able to, to, to support a young woman uh, in her 20s who wanted to run for, for the uh, city council. You know, I'm, I'm really in favor of tr us older people trying to make sure that we teach the younger people. Everybody is younger than me, so I can teach them. <laughs> I can teach them. And, and I know from experience what it means. It hurts. It hurts. When, when my father used to be called a boy and, and was not given the, the kind of respect he was due as a, 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 a grown man and, and a father who was raising two little girls by himself. And he was a carpenter and couldn't get jobs, but they, you know, he, he had to be satisfied with the pickup jobs that he got and everything. But even the unions weren't for him, weren't, weren't uh, 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 picking up the black carpenters and the black uh, electricians and, and, and so on. So those kinds of things we still have to, 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 to defend and to make sure that we understand that we have a lot to defend. We have a lot to be grateful for. And if we let these institutions get away from us, if we go to the countries like uh, Russia where People in Russia don't have civil rights and what have you. Let me tell you, it's going to hurt. And it's not going to hurt just me. It's going to hurt everybody in this country. So we have to really defend our country, just like we were fighting in a war. You've seen a lot of injustice yes. throughout your lifetime. Yes. But it's, you, you always strike me as somebody who never gives up. You always have been so tough and you have always, you know, just stayed so positive. Do you have any advice for how people can be that strong? Because it's well, so easy to get discouraged. Let me tell you, I do get discouraged at times. What I do is I talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> I talk and I listen. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and, and I try to make sure that I understand what little bit I can do, I have to do that. If I don't do anything else, do what you can do. Be a participant in the government. If you, if you like living in this country, contribute to this country. And, and that's what I always say, and that's what I always try to promote to my young people, to the older people, anybody who listen to me. And I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I listen a lot. And I try to get the straight facts because there are a lot of people who seem to hear the same things that I hear, but the, it, what comes out of their mouth is not what comes out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, They don't seem to understand that every participant in this country have to help defend this country. They have to do their share. I just want to say thank you to you for contributing to our culture. Paul, you've been marvelous. And, and this latest uh, exhibit that 
we we won't get a chance to see but but thank you so much for contributing to our culture and never letting it die thank you thank you thank you Well, wasn't she inspiring? Going to visit with Helen was like just getting the big hug that I needed this week. And I was so excited to get to share her insights and wisdom with all of you. And now we're going to visit live with another insightful, wise, wonderful friend of mine who posed for one of the pieces in this series. Hi, Susie Berto. <laughs> It, it's yeah. so good to see you. Um, Susie has, has, um, is a wonderful artist herself. We met because she was a member of the same art studio as me here in Monterey. She moved a little bit away from us, but I'm excited we can still connect with her virtually. So Susie, I wanted to ask you some questions. Um, what is your personal connection to the issue of voting rights in the US? Well, in 1942, my my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, my, um, you know, fam, my, uh, I wasn't born yet, but, um, but my grandparents on both sides, my parents, my aunts and uncles all were um, sent to internment camps in the um, different parts of the United States and the desolate parts of the United States. They had to sell everything they owned. They lost businesses. They lost their homes. They um, they left. The, they had to leave their leave their colleges, so they lost their. They had to leave their schools, so they lost their opportunities for education, and they were sent to these internment camps for. Nobody knew exactly how long because it was during the war, and it was, um, and there were about a hundred twenty thousand American citizens of Japanese descent that were sent to these camps, ten different locations, in in on um, kind of near the on the western side of the United States. Um, so they lost everything and, but they were still American citizens. And so when the, when the voting time came, they wanted to prove that they were loyal citizens by voting. And they really had to fight hard to be, well, first of all, there was no such thing as absentee ballots at that time. So um, they had to fight to be able to um, uh, vote. And they finally kind of put together some rules so that they could have an absentee ballot. So. In the end, I think it was 42, or maybe it was 44 by the time they got their chance to really vote again. And um, there were only 2,000 2, um, absentee ballots issued. And um, they were and I think Los Angeles said they only received a hundred of them and there were a lot more than a hundred ballots cast for California and Los Angeles. So um, anyway, I just, for me, the struggle for just to vote and to prove that you're Amer an American, a responsible, um, and, um, and committed citizen that it, you need to take advantage of the right to vote. I mean, uh, as, as being a woman, 
um, it's, you know, these, I remember being in a um, Girl Scout meeting for my God, with my goddaughter, and they were talking about voting. And I said, do you realize that women couldn't vote before 19, I mean, yeah, 1920. And they were shocked. And I said, well, you know, you've got to remember, and it's a responsibility now. We all have, there are a lot of things that we, um, our, our, our ancestors have, have experienced and we need, and we need to um, respect that work and the desire to vote and it's our responsibility. What would you say to someone who feels like their vote doesn't matter? Well, I, I still think that it does matter even, even, you know, my, my, my um, mother and her father-in-law one year voted against each other, but they, and my dad said, well, why did you bother to vote? And my mother and my grandfather said, well, we still need, you know, if we didn't vote, somebody else would. And um, then it would turn everything around. So I think every single vote does count. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Whether you, whether you vote on an issue or not, you still are have turned in a ballot. So yeah. I think that's you need you need to do that. Anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> um <laughs> I if if every single person didn't vote who if if the people that didn't vote the last election, who voted this election, it certainly did make a difference. So oh. I, I think that's, that's really, whichever side you were voting for, mm -hmm. I think, it, it, you know, it helps to know that you participated. Yes, absolutely. It's empowering in a way. Right. It makes you feel more involved and connected with the process. Yes. You know, I was just reading today in one of the fact check um, areas about the, the vote, and people are saying that more people voted than were registered. And the fact check said that that was not true, that they went on and there are this many registered voters, which actually meant in this particular state, 30% of the voters didn't vote. And I thought as close as this election was, mm -hmm. if that 30% had voted, that would have, could have tipped the scales one way or the other and truly made a difference. Yeah. I mean, in some of the states, it was just a, a handful of votes that, that made the difference. So it, it, right. but that was really the impetus for this whole concept of the series for me, thinking about the 2016 election and how only 54% of registered voters in the U.S., took part and and how could we learn from the stories of different people and and what their what they went through what their families went through to hopefully inspire us to do more to get more involved so now thank you so much Susie I'd like to um, now introduce you to another friend of mine who participated in this series another California friend she couldn't be with us here live today, but I had the chance to also speak with her and interview her about her painting. She's an awesome artist um, here in Monterey County. Her name is Therese Garcia. Women's suffragette movement. Some of them were jailed and imprisoned and I'm a woman. There would have been time where I would have been with them too. When I was 18, I went in my first time voting. I remember what an empowering experience that was and how I felt I could make a difference. The background of this painting is made up of 
ballots and voting pamphlets from the 1920 election, which was the first election that women from coast to coast could vote. My name is Therese Garcia and I'm a non-representational artist. I did go to college and I was actually a poli-sci major with an emphasis on international relations. And there was a period in my life, I have to be honest, when because of my political leanings where I would get a little frustrated and wonder if it makes a difference because it just seemed like the corruption or more socialistic um, paradigms in, in government society just really wasn't happening. But then as I'm older now, what I do realize is I've come full circle that to me it's still very important. I'm trying to unpack the complicated relationship with voting rights that we have here in the United States. Each painting is of an individual who would have been denied the right to vote at some point in time. This first painting, Therese Garcia, Monterey County, is a portrait of my friend, Therese. It is hard for me to imagine a time when someone like Therese would not have been allowed to cast her vote. There's a lot of bloodshed in the world. There always has been, and perhaps there always will be. But there's a lot of peace in the world, too. It's got me thinking about voting now, present tense, so I still think it's important because it's peaceful. You're putting your thoughts and motivations and intentions of what you want to see through candidates or measures, and you're doing it without bloodshed. It's, it's, it's like an opening to express yourself politically and socially and culturally. I was listening to, I think it's called KUSP, it's the Pacifica. They were doing a program on motivational speakers in the world. And they played Dr. Martin Luther King's speech when he was in London in 1963. We've had very little violence, and I think this is the eternal, to the eternal credit of the civil rights leaders who've advocated nonviolence. His speech was so empowering about rising above the inequalities in life, voting for things that are going to be prominently and expressively beneficial to all humans without bloodshed. For him to say that in light of the fact that his people and our people, African American or people of color, are still being subjugated to torture, for him to still have that high ideal and never give up, I was like, wow. So to me, voting's like that. Voting is a way for me to express I'm not going to give up. Maybe I do take it for granted that I can vote. I think most of us do, because how can we even imagine living in a time where women weren't allowed to vote? I probably would have been on the lines just marching. I've done it before, and I have done it recently too during this last administration's election. I have done it too for the environment. There were certain protests the year that he was elected in 2016. There was a women's march that was just local that I went with, and then also on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, there's one here. Yeah, I think I would have would have been marching and, and helping the fight, helping, helping the cause mm -hmm. towards something that I feel is more just than excluding people from our basic rights. I think my painting is phenomenal. It's got the dimensionality within the collage and the portrait that um, has this effect of going back and forth in space, which to me is intriguing, it's fascinating. The lightness of it, it's got a very light touch, but yet it's strong because it's got different layering going on. And it's very... I think very beautiful. I love Therese and I think she's such an inspiring person. The idea that someone like Therese would have been denied the right to vote to be a part of this process is just unfathomable to me. So I was really grateful to get to share her story with all of you. And now I wanna introduce you to another friend who's joining us live in Columbus, Ohio. He's actually at, uh, this is my friend, Ron Cole. He's, front, he's attending his own art show today at Easton Town Center, but he's taking a break from that to come and be a part of mine. So Ron, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And if you want, tell us tell us what you're doing. Promote your own show for a minute because I'm all about the cross-promoting. <laughs> well, right now I'm, I'm in the back of a boutique here, uh, uh, Lux Levels at Easton Town Center. So i uh not exactly <laughs> an art show environment from where I'm sitting here, but 
<laughs> I'm primarily an aviation artist, a historical artist. And um, so I'm here helping promote my work and heading into the Christmas season. And, and uh, but I, I had to be a part of what we're doing, of course. So I wouldn't miss it for the world. Well, thank you so much. And if you're in Columbus area, after you finish watching this, head over to Easton because Ron will be there until this evening. But now let's get on to the topic of what we're actually here to discuss today. So Ron, what is your personal connection to the issue of voting rights in the U.S.? Wow. Well, my story really begins February 28th, 1993, when federal agents attacked my church community just outside Waco, Texas. And if you're the over the age of 35, you probably remember that. Um, I certainly do. But what came out of that experience for me, there were really, really two relevant elements. One was that I spent almost six years in federal prison and was thus denied my right to vote completely and without exception for over 25 years until this year the first time I have been eligible to legally vote in my own country. And the other thing that came out of that experience was that I, I unfortunately witnessed at, from very close quarters, other forms of political change or attempted political change that are more angry, that are more craven and ultimately so destructive when people don't exercise their right to vote and they lose faith in the system. And in a way, I suppose this explanation kind of goes to what I know your next question is, but the importance of the vote for every person is that one, if you don't participate in the system, then you contribute to a lack of faith in that system and your government might not necessarily work within your interests. And I've certainly witnessed that firsthand. And the other thing that, that happens that I think is equally as terrible is if you don't participate in the system by exercising your vote, which is so important and sacred, then other people who may not agree with you, who likewise lose faith in that system, will take matters into their own hands and do terrible things. Mm -hmm. And that is what I witnessed when when somebody who in the wake of the Waco fire, I wrote a book about the situation and I toured the country giving speeches and someone at one of my speeches was named Timothy McVeigh. And he bought a copy of my book that day and he asked me to sign it for him, which I did. And he later carried that book, my book, in the Ryder truck that blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. I can't even describe to you the guilt and the feeling that I that I carry with me as a consequence of that and having witnessed that and just seen what lack of faith in democracy can do to a country and in this instance to a person that they would do that. And I don't know if my story <laughs> as I hear myself speak, I don't know if it sounds especially inspiring, but I feel like it's powerful and objectively I feel it's important. I do I do think it is inspiring. And since you did steal my next question, I'm gonna throw another <laughs> one at you. What okay. was it like for you now for the first time to get to vote this year? It was it was so so cathartic, so therapeutic, just so amazing. I, I yeah, I, I was raised in a very military conservative family. My father is still very conservative. Um, I was brought up that way, but it, part of that if it, in those days was a sense of civic duty. And so when I was eligible for the draft, I was, I was there first thing on my birthday to sign up for the draft. And I, I took my responsibility to vote seriously, but I don't think I really recognized just how important it is until it was taken from me. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who feels like their vote doesn't matter? Well, it's hard to it's it, 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 it's hard to put someone through your own experience. And in my instance, I wouldn't want to in a, in a thousand years. But I just feel like 
It is so important because again, if, if, if you don't take it seriously, then that, that, that lack of priorities, that lack of participation is infectious in a very negative way, just like this virus that we're having to deal with. And it's so destructive when, when a government feels like it's maybe not necessarily uh, being driven by the will of the people. And, and governments do run amok, and I've seen it firsthand. And it can happen in the United States of America. Maybe not to the extent of other nations on this earth, that is absolutely true, and we're a very lucky country in so many ways, but terrible things can and do happen here. And so take that vote seriously. It is a weapon in a good way, a good weapon, but if you don't exercise it and you don't use it responsibly and for good and for positivity uh, and in the interest of your community and your country, then some knucklehead will take matters into their own hands. And I've, like, I've seen it too, do terrible things. So take it seriously, exercise that right. It's so important and sacred. Thank you so much, Ron. I really appreciate you being a part of this. It means a lot. And everyone's participation. I just think, you know, there's so many perspectives and you can't, of course, tell the whole story in five paintings. These are just small little windows. But for me, my, my way of connecting to all of these issues is through personal interactions with, with people through their stories. And you certainly have a powerful story. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, thank you. The last painting that I'm going to share with you, the last model is my uh, good friend and art teacher, Linda Regula. Um, Linda passed away this summer, but in in the spring, we had every time I talked to Linda, she wanted to know what is your next project that you're working on. That was how how every conversation we had went. And so last spring, she we were chatting, and she asked, "What's your next project?" And I told her about this voter profile series, and then she shared with me a little bit about her own experience growing up in the mountains and how uncommon it was for women to vote, how it was really discouraged. And she asked if she could be a part of the show. So Linda was actually the last piece that I made. It was really very meaningful and powerful for me to get to paint her portrait and know that I was getting to share another piece of her story with the world. Um, and it's just how Linda would have wanted it. Linda had a story for everything. She was a wonderful storyteller. So I'm going to share a video with you now that, um, that shows the process of making the series, and or, I'm sorry, of making the, the painting of Linda and you will hear me reading uh, her words that she wrote about her own experience with voting. So here is Linda Regula. My name's Paul Richmond, and my new painting series, Voter Profile, opens this week at Not Sheep Gallery in Columbus, Ohio. The paintings portray individuals from disenfranchised groups painted on collaged ballots from a historically significant era. Linda Regula, Muskingum County. As a female born in the hollers of West Virginia in 1944, I lived in a black and white world. Few families living around us owned vehicles at that time, so I never heard of anyone walking out of the mountains to vote. I attended a one-room school. We had no television, newspapers, radio, or telephone, so we were virtually cut off from the outside world. We depended on the mountain grapevine, word of mouth, to hear news not associated with those actually living nearby. Girls and women were repeatedly told by dominant males that a woman's place is in the home and you should leave thinking to us men. I can't remember any of my female relatives, my grandmother or my mother, ever speaking of voting during my childhood. As a teenager, I came to live with my sister in Ohio, and the world opened up to me. At 18, having studied the history of our country, I was thrilled to vote in my first election and in each one since then. I like the diversity of all the different stories. Mm -hmm. 
So I just want to say thank you all so much for watching this today um, and uh, putting up with any technical difficulties we might have had. That kind of goes with the territory with these live streams. But it is a wonderful way for us to get to share artwork and share stories with a bigger audience than we would even be able to in person at the gallery. So um, thank you so much for watching. If you are interested in purchasing any of the pieces from the show, you can contact Karen at the gallery. I know the website address is up there at the top of the screen. And I wanted to um, ask Karen if she could take a moment to share some of the other artwork in the gallery too, because there are, it's a, it's a range of really awesome work by, by a group of incredible artists who are all activists also. So Karen, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you, Paul. And thank you for all of the artists uh, participating. And um, what you said was really uh, both relevant and touching. And I appreciated hearing the stories. Thank you. I think we're all excited that this election is, is winding up. Uh, but I think all of us need to realize with as close as everything was that we still have work to do. We have work to do for the rest of our lives to continue to make progress and move forward, not just with voting, but with women and LGBTQ rights and um, uh, health care issues and financial issues and all sorts of things we need to tackle, continue to tackle, uh, continue to fight for. And so this gallery will be open um, showing controversial and political work. I'm in the short north. It's 17 West Russell Street, uh, which is right down the street from Hammond Harkins. And I'll show you some of the other pieces that, um, that are in the show now, which are great. This is actually one of Paul's pieces. Oh, I like that <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is called Not What You Think. These are some actual masks. So the October show was the mask we wear and uh it it was talking both about identity issues and physical masks and uh, how we present ourselves to the world and then that kind of segued into the voter profile um this is a piece by david underwood shelter in place so that obviously talks about our mask issue with covid19 and um a lot of the clay sculptures the people are masked because they're not paying attention to reality. Um, these are Paul's photo profile pieces. This is the wolf in sheep's clothing. And uh, some other mask pieces. This is one of my favorites here. Julie Burns, Eat My Tweet, which I just left up because it's so relevant. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. And Blind Justice by David Hosteller, a carved wood piece. And this piece, which is just like a spectacular creation by Sue Cavanaugh that went up at the last minute. She had been working on this uh, piece that is cutouts, paper doll cutouts of how many people have died of COVID in Ohio since it started. And when she finished the piece, there were 4,300 paper dolls in here that she had cut and hand colored. And since then has had to add pieces to continue the count of people dying from COVID. Um, this is obviously not just a, a, a really important piece. It says it is what it is, which was Trump's statement about people dying, uh, which she felt was really insensitive. She wanted to present it in a way though that was more um, in a sense, whimsical, when we think about paper dolls and children. Um, but children are dying of this, and, and so it kind of had this dichotomy, uh, this way of both speaking and touching about things. But um, that's our show. We'd love for you to stop in, say hi. Um, I'll Zoom call Paul anytime, and you can talk to him about his work. <laughs> yeah. And otherwise, I'll be here to talk your ear off. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye.